Welcome to World Roundup. It's your weekly summary of events that have shaped your world for the better and for the worse this week. I'm your host, Lisa Wilson. Let's check out this week's lineup. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto form a new Jubilee party. A Belfast court makes a landmark ruling to allow a 14-year-old girl to sue Facebook over the posting of a nude pic of her on their site. Tens of thousands of cheering supporters fill the Nairobi Sports Stadium as Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, and his deputy, William Ruto, launch their new Jubilee party. The announcement comes less than a year before the presidential election, but some analysts believe this announcement was more for show than for substance. It is finally Kenya's president launched a new political party that he intends to use for a second and last term in office in the 2017 elections. The launch of the Jubilee Party followed days of political haggling in Nairobi as the 12 parties dissolved and united under the new organization. Tens of thousands of people dressed in party colors thronged a stadium in Kasarani, a residential area of Nairobi, to witness the launch of the Jubilee Party. The ruling party and the current government took the opportunity to show how people had benefited under their rule. President Uhuru Kenyatta told the crowd that the new party affirmed togetherness and peace. We are here as a jubilee family to proclaim the meaning of our party, he said. The party we launch here today is an expression of our unity. In launching it, we renew and strengthen our ties that bind Kenyans together. We rise from the ashes of conflict to express the beauty of reconciliation and collective purpose. In 1966, three years after Kenya gained independence, the biggest two political parties, the Kenya African National Union and the Kenya Africa Democratic Union, merged. The unity political commentators said followed years of ethnic nationalization. Twenty-five years after the agreement, some politicians and activists took to the streets, demanding multi-party democracy. Then, in late 2007, political violence erupted after incumbent President Mwami Kibaki won elections and was sworn into office. A power sharing deal in early 2008 ended the crisis. Last week, Deputy President William Ruto told party delegates that multi-party democracy had contributed to intercommunal fighting in Kenya during elections. He said he was confident a new party would bring some normalcy to the country. Kenyatta and Ruto were accused of being behind the 2007-2008 violence when it charged at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. In the ethnic fighting, more than 1,000 people were killed and at least 250,000 were were uprooted from their homes. Ruto said he and the president had a desire to bring different parties together and form one party with a national agenda. Now for some hard news that make headlines across the globe. Russia says Syrian regime forces were fully respecting a ceasefire but that rebel fighters had violated it 23 times. As the televised briefing cut to a military monitor by the key Castello road into Aleppo, a crucial supply route for humanitarian aid which has been under Syrian regime control, gunfire broke out and the Russian officer dived for cover. There was no way of independently verifying where the firing was coming from. Syrian government troops have completely stopped firing with the exception of areas where Islamic State and fighters are active. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for armed units trolled by the U.S. On the road to Castello, work to equip a checkpoint for the Syrian branch of the Red Crescent Committee is being completed. According to the Syrians, it will be ready to be presented today at 1900 hours. Some 80 locals, described by police as far right, brawled with 20 young asylum seekers in Bertusen, east of Germany. The asylum seekers were chased through their hostel and put under police guard. The mayor said the town had to avoid becoming a playground for the far right. A curfew has been imposed on the young asylum seekers. Anti-migrant tensions have been mounting in Bozen this year. 
Federal prosecutors in Brazil filed corruption charges on Wednesday against the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, describing the popular lefties as leader of a massive embezzlement ring at state oil company Petrobras. The charges alleged that Lula received the equivalent of 1.1 million U.S. dollars in bribes. Among the allegations are that Lula and his wife received a beachside apartment and upgrades to the property from a major construction company, OAS, which was one of the players in the Petrobras scheme. The allegations are not new, but they now go before Judge Cerrito Moro, head of the Petrobras investigation, who will decide whether to accept them, forcing Lula's case to trial. Petrobras singled out Lula, who was president during much of the time that Petrobras was being systematically fleeced by a network of corrupt executives and politicians as the scheme's mastermind. Prosecutor Delto Dalagato called Lula, who is 70, the supreme commander. Lula has repeatedly declared his innocence and says the prosecution is politically motivated. I have no doubt that Lava Jato chose Lula as the perpetrator. It looked for a crime but found nothing after an investigation, and today it presented the charges, accusations that are absolutely unreal. It is a tactic of illusionism because it gives him a property that simply does not exist. I understand that, yes. There is a persecution, and more than that, there is a real intention to eliminate former President Lula from the political election paranormal for 2018. As the Dalai Lama arrives in France for his first visit in five years, we look at the place Buddhism and its teachings hold in a society that prides itself on its secular beliefs. The analysis of religion in French society was initially brought to the fore by the nation's stance on the now controversial bikini issue. It's time for class at the small Buddhist center in Paris where regulars come in for an evening of meditation. I think we live in a society that is mainly performance-based and I wanted to move away from that a little bit. I was an active man. I liked taking part in activities with people, but I wasn't really interested in the people themselves. Now I've discovered a whole new world. The center opened 18 years ago and teaches its members the foundations of Buddhism and meditation with a contemporary twist. Beginner classes today are fully booked, but the manager who moved here from Britain 13 years ago says that wasn't always the case. People were pretty wary. They wondered if Buddhism was a cult. Oftentimes, those who came here to meditate didn't tell their family or their colleagues. A little farther east, right on the edge of Paris, lies this Tibetan temple. The Buddhism practiced here stays closer to religious texts with nearly daily rituals that attract old and young alike. We often see 20 or 30 year olds and people who are at the end of their lives and looking for something more. In that case, Buddhism isn't a journey, it gives meaning, a sense of hope. For me, Buddhism represents hope. A sense of hope, a personal journey. Buddhism in the West has taken on many forms. But anthropologist Marion Dapson says the appeal is far more religious than it appears. I met people who said they were not religious but who practiced rituals, who bowed before the Dalai Lama, who took magic pills to purify their karma, who walked circles around relics and prayed to gods. I thought, how can you claim to reject religion while doing all of that? A religion for some, a spiritual journey for others. Buddhism is now firmly ingrained in France, with some five million followers and counting. All over the world, governments are struggling to balance the concept of freedom of speech and association with the right to privacy. In our own country, parliamentarians are struggling to define the limits of freedom on the internet, especially when it comes to posting indecent pictures to social network sites such as Facebook. Well, this week, a court in the Irish capital of Belfast made a landmark ruling allowing a 14-year-old girl to sue the tech giant for allowing someone to post a nude pic of her. Let's take a look.
Facebook has lost a legal bid to prevent a 14-year-old girl from suing the social media giant over a naked photo that was posted on a shame page. The social network insists it's protected under European law. A high court judge in Belfast rejected an attempt by Facebook to have the girl's claim thrown out. The teen, who cannot be named due to her age, is seeking damages for misuse of private information, negligence and breach of the Data Protection Act after a naked photo was posted on a shame page several times between November 2014 and January 2016. The girl's lawyers alleged the nude photo was obtained through blackmail and was published as a form of revenge. The attorneys also argue that Facebook had the power to block republication of the picture by using a tracking process to identify the image. They equate the incident to a form of child abuse. But a lawyer for Facebook has argued that the claim for damages should be dismissed, stressing that the company took down the photo when it was notified. The company's attorney also cited a European directive which they say provides protection from having to monitor vast amounts of material uploaded online. The girl is also taking legal action against the man who allegedly posted the picture on the site. The case against both Facebook and the man behind the photo will now move to full trial in Belfast. Now for a look at those life-changing events that were shaped by the forces of nature. Protesters in the southern Indian city of Bangalore have attacked shops and set fire to vehicles in a long-running dispute about water. They were angry at a Supreme Court ruling ordering Karnataka to share some water with neighboring Tamil Nadu. Karnataka must release 12,000 cubic feet of water per second from the Kaveri River until 20 September. Both states say they urgently need water for irrigation and a battle about access to it has raged for decades. The violence in the technology hub closed many offices and much of the public transport system. Floods that devastated North Korea last month are turning out to be worse than initially feared, with more than 100 people left homeless, according to aid workers who visited the area. That puts Pyongyang in the inconvenient position of having to turn to the international community for help, at the same time as the country is facing global condemnation after its latest nuclear test last year. North Korea's government has confirmed that 133 people have been killed and another 395 people are missing as a result of the floods. Tens of thousands of homes have lost power across Taiwan as the island was hit by Super Typhoon Meranti, a storm rater the strongest in the world so far this year, forcing schools and businesses to close, leading to flight cancellations and leaving a trail of damage. Taiwan's Central Weather Bureau warned that the Category 5 storm would threaten several southern and eastern cities, including Kaohsiung and Haoliang, with strong winds, torrential rain and flooding. Meranti, which grew in strength as it neared Taiwan, was carrying maximum winds of 216 km per hour, according to meteorologists. Fallen power cables and trees were among some of the early damage. A fire swept through a slum on the outskirts of Brazil's biggest city and authorities, forcing hundreds of people to flee as flames consumed their wooden homes. The fire was brought under control three hours later after it began, Lieutenant Colonel Roberto Logo of the Sao Paulo Fire Department told reporters. He said the fire destroyed most of the shanty town in Asasco, a suburb of the edge of Sao Paulo. There had been no reports of injuries or deaths. Images aired by the global TV showed large black clouds of smoke hovering over the slum. The network also showed residents desperately trying to save personal belongings like mattresses, stoves, computers and refrigerators before the flames reached their homes. The newspaper Carrero Palcito in Osasco said the shanty town is home to about 1,000 people living in 120 shacks. The rights of indigenous peoples is a point of contention all around the world. This week, a Native American tribe took in a major oil company in defense of the ancestral lands. Pushing back the bulldozers, hundreds of American Indian protesters managed to halt construction of an oil pipeline in North Dakota. I fought for this country. So these assholes 
could do this to our land. Now is my time to fight for my, my people. The Sioux of Standing Rock claim the crew dug up and destroyed sacred burial grounds near their reservation, even after the pipeline developer had voluntarily paused construction in the disputed area. They'd already filed a suit against the pipeline's proposed route on cultural grounds, but also environmental ones. This is the Cannonball River. And this flows into the Missouri River, which is just over there. Pipes always break. It will break. And within about 10 minutes, it'll be to our freshwater intake for the tribe. In this makeshift camp, the nerve center of the protest, dozens of Native American tribes are uniting to support the Sioux of North Dakota. Navajos, Apaches, Iroquois, this is an unprecedented gathering of former rivals. They've all felt this pain. They've all felt the misery that comes with big business and corporations invading our lands and taking the little bit of resources we have, whether that be whether that be water or whether that be timber or minerals, they've all felt that in their own homelands. The tribe is locked in a court battle to force a diversion of the pipeline. In the meantime, protesters are here to stay, protecting their land from any further destruction. Now for those events that made a major impact on the world of politics. A report instigated by Hollywood actors George Clooney and Don Cheadle has accused the political elite in South Sudan of profiting while the country is divided by civil war. A two-year undercover investigation by the Santru Group founded by Clooney and fellow activist John Pendergrast found President Salva Kiir, former Vice President Rick Mishar and the military generals made fortunes while being paid modest government salaries. The report said they accumulated an array of luxury homes, including in Australia, Malaysia, Uganda and Kenya, a variety of expensive cars, and enriched themselves and their families through stakes in oil and other business ventures. Venezuela is currently hosting the 17th Non-Aligned Movement Summit, which is on the island of Margarita from September 13 to the 18th. With 120 member states, the NAM is the second largest international body after the United Nations. It has 53 members from Africa, 39 from Asia and 26 from Latin America and the Caribbean, 17 observer countries and 10 observer organizations. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and Foreign Minister Dalcy Rodriguez have said that Venezuela is also honored to assume the organization's rotating presidency for the next three years after taking over from Iran during the summit. Venezuela's opposition leader and president of parliament, Henry Ramos Aloub, says that the upcoming non-aligned summit is not going to hide or wipe out the country's crisis. Chinese police fired rubber bullets at villagers and arrested 13 people on Tuesday in an overnight crackdown to suppress demonstrations in a southern fishing village that became internationally known five years ago for protesting land seizures. Police stormed into the village of Mukan in the southern province of Guntong and arrested leaders of ongoing demonstrations in their homes. Videos posted on social media show one person with blood on his arm and chest and another being treated for an apparent bullet wound on his hand. Another video shows a line of black police vans streaming into the village, a hamlet of about 13,000 people on the South China Sea near Hong Kong. The Philippines will pursue independent foreign and military policies separate from U.S. interests in the region. The country's president said that, announcing that in order to avoid any confrontations with China, he would just have to hold joint Filipino Navy patrols with the U.S. The Asian country may now also have to look towards China and Russia in order to acquire new weapons so that it can improve its capabilities tackling insurgencies and terrorism in the country. In April, the Filipino Navy began joint South China Sea naval patrols with the U.S. to respond to China building artificial islands over the disputed reefs. 
President Rodrigo Duterte, who has been openly critical of the American security policies announced in a televised speech on Tuesday before military officers in Manalia, a paradigm shift in the country dealing with allies. Now for the news that's not quite from this world. A gigantic 30-ton chunk of the famous Campo del Cielo meteorite fall has been found outside of a small town in Argentina. The Concedo meteorite was found on September 10, 2016 by a team of meteorite hunters from the Astronomy Association of the Chaco. This is the second largest piece ever found in the Campo del Cielo region. Concedo is the name of the town and Chaco is the province in Argentina where the meteorite was found. Scientists estimate about 4,500 years ago, a 600-ton space rock entered Earth's atmosphere and broke apart, sending a shower of metallic meteorites across a 1,350-square-kilometer region northwest of Buenos Aires. The region has at least 26 craters. On Wednesday, the European Space Agency released the first data in its effort to create the most precise and detailed 3D map of our little corner of the universe, one that would, once complete, chart over 1 billion stars in the Milky Way. The data dump pins down the precise position in the sky and the brightness of 1,442 million stars. In addition, it also features the distances and the motions across the sky for more than 2 million stars. Gaia is an astrometry satellite. It's uh, designed to measure distances and proper motions of stars, mainly in our galaxy, but some outside our galaxy, uh, with the intention that if we can chart the motions of the stars, we can help to disentangle the clusters and mergers of galaxies that came with ours and try to figure out where the, how our galaxy was formed and where these different things came from. The advance of technology cannot be stopped. This is the drive behind a new bus system in Madagascar that teaches young children how to do complicated coding exercises. Twice a week, this bus makes its way across Antananarivo, Madagascar's capital. But there are no passengers on board. The real journey starts upon arrival at Ivato City Hall, where young people are learning to code. After a dozen lessons, they've already been able to create a computer game. The ball must touch the pole to score points. If the ball stays on the pole for a long time, the score goes up. But if the ball doesn't stay long, the score only goes up a little bit. For the past year, volunteers have been teaching basic coding using equipment mostly donated by telecoms company Airtel. For the program's director, knowing how to code has become an essential life skill. They could become engineers, or if not, there are many other careers being created each year when it comes to new technologies. So they could create a startup that could solve any problem. Or like us, they could also raise awareness, teach others how to code. 14-year-old Tiana sees a bright future thanks to what she's learning on the course. I don't have a computer at home, but I do go to a cyber cafe twice a week. I surf the internet, go on Facebook and play Need for Speed. When I grow up, I'd like to create something, create computer games, cartoons, and also have a computer. About 500 children from five of the capital's suburbs were able to attend the free course for three weeks. The program's volunteers hope coding will soon become part of the country's education system, laying the foundations for a new computer-savvy generation. And we have some more news from the world of tech and science. Indonesia's tax office will investigate Alphabet Inc.'s Google for alleged unpaid taxes in Southeast Asia's largest economy. This is according to a senior finance ministry official on Thursday. Samsung shares plunged on Monday after the South Korean electronics giant urged global users to stop using its Galaxy Note 7 smartphone due to a spate of exploding batteries that raised alarm around the world. Stepping up its warnings, the world's largest smartphone maker on Sunday told Note 7 users worldwide to immediately turn the device off.
Samsung Electronics on September 2 had announced their recall of its oversized phablet after faulty batteries caused some handsets to burst into flames during charging. Since then, airlines and air safety agencies around the world have warned passengers against using them on flights. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission on Friday urged Note 7 users to stop using the device at all. Beijing's internet regulator on Thursday confirmed it had closed a number of live broadcast websites in the most recent round of its clean internet campaign. The Beijing subsidiary of the Cyberspace Administration of China said it had issued rectification orders for problems ranging from broadcast content to usernames to shared contents. Russia's media watchdog had blocked access to two of the world's largest pornography sites. Internet service providers had until Tuesday to implement the ban. The sites now redirect to a message explaining they have been blocked by decision of public authorities. In 2015, the authorities banned 11 popular pornography websites, saying many failed to protect children from information harmful to their health. The decision was made following two separate court rulings, which said the website spread pornography. Sexually explicit content is not outlawed in Russia, but the law bans the illegal production, dissemination and advertisement of pornographic materials and objects. Let's take a closer look at the more brainier side of life. In the basement of this psychiatric hospital in Belgium, visitors are met with a gruesome sight. Here, there were almost 3,000 human brains, the biggest collection in the world, taken from the mentally ill, epileptics, people with Alzheimer's, and even boxers. It's a scientific treasure chest, to be used for research into illnesses such as depression or schizophrenia. Nowadays in Belgium, it's really hard, if not almost impossible, to get your hands on, on actual tissue uh, of uh, patients after they have deceased. The collection was started in 1951 by a British doctor and was almost lost because of a lack of storage space in London. Now transferred to Belgium, each pickled brain comes with its own medical file, kept up until the death of the patient. These brains of the collected in the 1950s and early 60s are from patients that never got in contact with these drugs. So that makes that we can investigate brains of psychiatric uh, patients that have only suffered from the illness and have not had the impact of these drugs. This is a whole human brain. The brain is the body's most well-protected organ and therefore the most difficult to get to and the hardest to study. This makes the collection all the more important. We are looking at whether inflammation in the brain can cause or worsen or influence in some way um, the disease course of several psychiatric disorders. Just one of the questions the team is hoping to answer in the months to come. That's all from me, Lisa Wilson. Until next week, cheers.